Every day thereafter, Clara incessantly boasted about her fiancé, emphasizing his high education, wealth, and prestigious family residing in a luxurious city neighborhood. She extended a reluctant invitation to my wedding as a final chance to witness something splendid, but I had no intention of attending. I cared little for witnessing her in a wedding dress and anticipated being seated among other female employees, regardless of the venue's glamour or the food's quality. As these thoughts crossed my mind, Clara decided to showcase a picture of her fiancé's house on her smartphone. With an air of excitement, she presented the photo, expecting my astonishment. However, to her surprise, I recognized the house immediately. Attempting to conceal my familiarity, I nonchalantly revealed that it was, in fact, my family home. I, Kyla Chris, a 29-year-old employee at a modest-sized librarian, have been single and working there for over nine years. As the oldest among the female employees, I quickly cut off her envious remarks about the luxurious home that, unbeknownst to her, I belonged to. I find myself in a position often labeled as the old maid, the sole survivor among the women who joined the librarian when I did, all of whom have departed after getting married. Contrary to assumptions, I'm not working here to find a husband. I diligently engage in my work every day. Preferring solitude, I'm not particularly adept at socializing, earning me the reputation of a stick in the mud among my peers. Despite my reserved nature, my dedication to work over the years has garnered a level of cautious respect from other employees. While I understand their perspective, I don't attend social events, exchange contact information, or engage in unnecessary conversations. This might make me appear dull and uninviting, but my seniority and proficiency in my role seem to deter any complaints. Personally, I find it convenient not to be approached by others. I can work in peace, enjoy my breaks freely, and escape any troublesome human relations drama. The nature of my job doesn't involve entertaining or client-facing tasks, allowing me to spend my days off indulging in my favorite anime and impulse-buying books at the bookstore. At first glance, some might perceive my life as lonesome and empty, but I find happiness in this quiet and peaceful existence. However, Everything took a turn when a young woman named Clara joined the librarian. Clara, in stark contrast to me, she is a friendly, cheerful woman with excellent communication skills. Clara was the proactive type, easily connecting with others, especially popular among male colleagues due to her cuteness and charm. Observing her, I felt like I was watching a character from a movie, a bright and honest woman at the center of attention, the kind of person I'd find challenging to deal with. One day, while fixing my makeup in the restroom, I overheard a group of female employees gossiping about her. They found Clara annoying, accusing her of trying too hard to please men and constantly appearing cute. Some even questioned her ability to do her job properly, attributing her reliance on male colleagues to their failure to teach her. Despite her efforts, Clara was coldly dismissed by female employees multiple times, leaving her downhearted and seeking solace in male colleagues. Reflecting on this, I realized that, like Clara, I'm probably a subject of gossip among my female peers, albeit with different content. Being the oldest and efficient in my role, I'm likely spared from such situations. Interpersonal relationships can be exhausting, and I'm grateful to avoid getting involved. With these thoughts, I quietly waited until they finished fixing their makeup and left. Clara was surprisingly socializing with female colleagues, fitting in seamlessly. As I headed outside for my usual lunch break, Clara, along with other employees, called out to me. To my surprise, she posed a rather malicious question. Why aren't you married, ma'am? The female employees behind her erupted in laughter, and even male colleagues joined in. Encouraged by the response, one of the female employees praised Clara for being funny leading to a series of increasingly disrespectful questions aimed at me. Clara seemed eager for recognition, intensifying her remarks with each question. The surrounding employees found it amusing and encouraged her to continue, fostering a hostile environment. As the situation escalated, Clara started flaunting her own status, boasting about receiving a designer bag from her boyfriend and dining at exclusive restaurants. Rather than feeling angered, I began to find her attempts at one-upmanship almost impressive. The petty exchanges continued, 
with Clara using sarcasm to highlight what she perceived as my lack of connection to luxury items. I found myself increasingly burdened by Clara's work. She had become overbearing and showed an invincible disregard for fear, turning into a rather challenging presence for the other female employees. Eventually, she transformed into a monster. Then, one day, she came to work in high spirits and began talking to me about her recent engagement. Unprompted, she showed me a picture of her fiancé. In response to her news, I politely offered congratulations and attempted to return to my work. However, Clara continued to chatter, boasting about her fiancé's wealth, kindness, and perfection. She even brought her smartphone closer to show off more details, belittling me in the process. Despite my attempts to remain composed, I couldn't help but admit my jealousy and congratulate her sincerely. Once she left, I sighed deeply, reminding myself to focus on my work. However, I overheard the other female employees talking behind me, expressing disdain for Clara's behavior. They criticized her for acting overly giddy just because she was getting married, speculating about her future marital happiness and casting doubts on her ability to manage household chores. Out of curiosity, I asked if they were not friends with Clara anymore, to which they emphatically denied any friendship. It became apparent that, despite her previous bullying, Clara had managed to make enemies among the female employees, especially as she tried to outshine and one-up everyone. I sighed quietly, realizing that the very people criticizing Clara were the ones who fueled her arrogance. She continued boasting about her fiancé almost daily, emphasizing his prestigious background, high education, substantial income, and the opulent family home in Manhattan. Clara took every opportunity to mock my appearance, suggesting that only leftovers would consider marrying me, and that even an uneducated and unemployed man might reject me as a dried-up old maid. Amid her laughter, she insisted on inviting me to her wedding, claiming it would be my last shining moment. The prospect of attending her wedding held no appeal for me. I dismissed any thoughts of glamorous venues and delicious food, foreseeing an uncomfortable experience seated with those judgmental female employees. As I contemplated this, Clara abruptly shifted her focus, announcing her intention to show me a picture of her fiancé's parents' house. Uninterested, I hoped to avoid the conversation. However, she insisted, manipulating her smartphone to display the images. The house appeared familiar, and she declared its splendor, proudly claiming it would be hers eventually. She reveled in being part of the rich gang and casually mentioned inviting me over. Unfazed, I interrupted her excitement, revealing that the house was, in fact, my parents' residence. What are you talking about? I mean, this house in the photo. When I mentioned that, Clara appeared shocked, saying, Huh? What are you saying? Just because you're envious, you shouldn't make such a lame claim. Undeterred, I asserted that this was genuinely my parents' house. As an only child with no brothers who could marry her or anyone else, only my parents in their 60s and our beloved dog lived there. Clara, seemingly thinking I was joking, laughed out loud, commenting on my ability to keep a straight face while fooling around. Persisting in my seriousness, I pointed out the details, like the car parked in the photo. Despite her objections, the undeniable truth was that the photo showcased my parents' house, its layout, the placement of things, all precisely matching the house I grew up in. Suddenly, it clicked. I recalled a salesman named Carl who frequented my parents' house, pretending it was his to impress Clara. I inquired about her fiancé's name, and it matched the salesman. Realizing Carl's deceit, I kept other troubling signs about him to myself. Even when my parents declined the contract, he would cheerfully respond, I'll come by again next time. But the moment he left, his face turned menacing. I decided not to share these details with Clara, but I affirmed, That house is definitely my parents' house. I won't back down on that. Clara, raising her voice, expressed disbelief, unable to fathom that the house was mine. I explained the situation, but she wouldn't believe me. So, after work that day, I decided to take her to my parents' house. Upon arriving, we passed through the gate, and as I opened the front door, I cheerfully announced, I'm home. 
To our surprise, my parents emerged with smiles, offering a warm welcome. They expressed delight at seeing me, mentioning it's not often and that it's nice to have a guest. In response, they decided to serve some sweets they brought from a trip to France with my aunt, accompanied by tea. Observing Clara, my parents greeted her happily. I brought up the name of her fiancé and asked my parents about him. They casually referred to him as the salesman who had visited recently. Accepting this reality, Clara seemed at ease. Once in my room, however, she unexpectedly burst into tears. Concerned, I inquired about the cause, wondering if it was the shock of being deceived about his family home. While being misled was certainly unsettling, it didn't seem like a catastrophic event. Apologizing, Clara began to share the details of her engagement with Carl. Apparently, they met at a social gathering, where Carl portrayed himself as holding a significant position in a major corporation. During private moments, he conveyed that his family was wealthy, influencing her attraction to his appearance and status. As their relationship progressed through a few dates, it was revealed that, despite his corporate position, Carl was surprisingly frugal. Initially covering all expenses, he gradually shifted the financial burden onto Clara, claiming he had no cash on hand. When she confronted him about this, Carl abruptly proposed, confessing something unexpected. Caught off guard by the proposal, Clara started shelling out cash as Carl directed, believing it was for their wedding fund. He took advantage, borrowing increasingly larger sums until she had handed over a substantial amount. Despite objective observations suggesting that a wealthy family wouldn't need such loans, Clara, deeply in love, blindly trusted him. Eventually, she realized the deception, leading her to apologize tearfully. Expressing remorse, Clara admitted being influenced by other female employees to harass me. Pressured to join in or risk exclusion, she endured the situation, finding solace in her relationship with Carl. Seeing her struggle, I empathized, recognizing her sincere apology. Despite her past actions, I decided to support her in confronting Carl. Arranging a meeting at a cafe, Carl changed his demeanor upon seeing me. Uncomfortable, he lowered his gaze as I confronted him about reporting his misuse of the family home photo and deceiving Clara. Pale and apologetic, he admitted approaching her for financial reasons, assuming she had money based on her attire and accessories. In response, I decided to take action against the liar who had involved my family and teach him a lesson. I presented you with a pleasant dream, so consider it a token of gratitude he audaciously declared. His boldness triggered memories of the hidden side I witnessed from my family home's window. I reminded him of the proposal he made to Clara, and Carl responded with a defiant laugh, stating it was merely the best thing to say. Shocked, I confronted him, asking if he had no intention of marrying Clara, to which he casually admitted, Yes, I'm not thinking about getting married right away. Clara, unable to bear the revelation, started crying, revealing the true nature of Carl. Determined not to show mercy, I produced a voice recorder, informing Carl that his statements were recorded and that he could face consequences for breaking off the engagement without reasonable cause. Panicking, Carl chose to repay the money borrowed from Clara along with damages, avoiding potential exposure. As it turned out, Carl had been cheating and his mistress was spending money beyond his means. Smitten with her, he resorted to siphoning money from Clara to keep her satisfied. After reaching an agreement at the cafe, Carl left, and Clara expressed profound gratitude. She apologized once again, promising to change her ways. Since then, Clara has grown fond of me, shedding her previous attitude. Even when other female employees act unpleasantly, she no longer lets it bother her and focuses on her work. Despite ongoing gossip from her colleagues, Clara seems resilient and determined to move forward. Dealing with them wasn't worth the trouble. When one of the female employees got engaged, it sparked a nasty war of words among them. Petty jealousies and grudges began affecting their work, and a fed-up supervisor escalated the issue, resulting in each of them being transferred to different departments. Now, in their respective departments, these women seem to be working quietly. In our department, the atmosphere has become peaceful and calm, Clara, in particular, has found the freedom to work more efficiently. Lately, Clara and I have been sharing lunches, discovering common hobbies. 
Thanks to her influence, I've developed an interest in fashion, while she has become a big fan of anime. Though I may not be friendly with everyone, having someone like Clara whom I can trust has made working at this librarian more enjoyable. Money and status may be attractive, but they're not everything. In their absence, a plain, peaceful, and calm daily life becomes the truest source of happiness. Today, I prepared my lunch, aspiring to become a better cook. Please have a taste, I offered. Clara suggested going to a nearby park to eat, and I replied with a cheerful, Yes, 